5. The Sabbath and Law St. Augustine spoke of the goal of history as the great Sabbath which has no evening. He concluded his confessions with a statement on the meaning of the Sabbath as the goal of history. 35. 50. O Lord God, give peace unto us. For Thou hast given us all things, the peace of rest, the peace of the Sabbath, which has no evening. For all this most goodly array of things, very good, having finished their courses, is to pass away, for in them there was morning and evening. 36. 51. But the seventh day has no evening, nor hath its setting, because thou hast sanctified it to an everlasting continuance, that that which thou didst after thy works which were very good, resting on the seventh day, although thou madest them in unbroken rest, that may the voice of thy book announce beforehand unto us, that we also after our works, therefore very good, because thou hast given them us, shall rest in thee also in the Sabbath of eternal life. 37. 52. For then shalt thou so rest in us, as now thou workest in us, and so shall that be thy rest through us, as these are thy works through us. But thou, Lord, ever workest, and art ever at rest. Nor dost thou see in time, nor art moved in time, nor restest in a time, and yet thou makest things seen in time. Yea, the times themselves, and the rest which results from time. 38. 53. We therefore see these things which thou madest, because they are, but they are because thou seest them. And we see without that they are, and within that they are good, but thou sawest them there, when made, where thou sawest them yet to be made. And we were at a later time moved to do well, after our hearts had conceived of thy spirit. But in the former time we were moved to do evil, forsaking thee. But thou, the one, the good God, didst never cease doing good. And we also have some good works of thy gift, but not eternal. After them we trust to rest in thy great hallowing. But thou, being the good which needeth no good, art ever at rest, because thy rest is thou thyself. And what man can teach man to understand this? Or what angel? An angel? Or what angel? A man? Let it be asked of thee, sought in thee, knocked for at thee, so shall it be received, so shall it be found so shall it be opened. Amen. Westcott spoke of the Sabbath rest of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9 as a rest which closes the manifold forms of earthly preparation and work, the hexameron of human toil, not an isolated Sabbath, but a Sabbath life. The Sabbath rest answers to the creation as its proper consummation. Westcott, citing St. Augustine, then called attention to rabbinical commentaries. The Jewish teachers dwelt much upon the symbolic meaning of the Sabbath as prefiguring the world to come. One passage quoted by Schottgen and others may be given. The people of Israel said, Lord of the whole world, show us the world to come. God, blessed be he, answered, Such a pattern is the Sabbath. Jalk, Rube, page 95.4 
In this connection, the double ground which is given for the observance of the Sabbath, the rest of God, Exodus chapter 20 verse 11, and the deliverance from Egypt, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15, finds its spiritual confirmation. The final rest of man answers to the idea of creation realized after the fall by redemption. This view of the Sabbath is not only the teaching of the church fathers like Augustine and of rabbis, but also of modern Protestant commentators. Lenski, who pointed out that God rested from his works, not from his labours, noted that it was the ordained eternal rest from before creation. Schneider noted further that this rest is not a forlorn bliss blotting out activity. It is rather the active rest, Luther, in which the perfected church adores and praises God. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 are the foundation for this interpretation of the Sabbath. Canaan, the promised land, was a foreshadowing of the true Sabbath, but the true Sabbath could not be identified with it. Beyond all the types, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9, or it can be translated that there remains a Sabbath or a Sabbath rest to the people of God. As Moulton noted of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10, Man's Sabbath rest begins when he enters into God's rest. Genesis chapter 2 verse 2 As that was the goal of the creative work, so to the people of God this rest is the goal of their life of works. Certain general observations can now be made concerning the Sabbath. First, the foregoing makes it clear that the Sabbath has always had reference to the future. The pattern of the Sabbath is in the past from the Sabbath of creation. The entrance into the Sabbath is also in the past. For Israel, it was the redemption from Egypt. For the church, it is the resurrection. The fulfillment of the Sabbath is in the new creation. The Sabbath is a present rest based on past events with a future reference and fulfillment. Second, and closely related to the future reference of the Sabbath, the law of the Sabbath required providence, that is, a provident people. Because of the short-term nature of debt, only emergency debts could be contracted. In each century, 16 years were Sabbaths, including two jubilee years. While God promised an abundant harvest for faithfulness to his law, it was still necessary for man to use that abundance providently or else he would be unable to live. Providence in management means an obviously future-oriented perspective. Instead of a past-oriented and consumption-centered economy, the Sabbath produced a production-centered, future-oriented and rest-conscious society. A provident society can rest with peace and security, and a productive society is best able to enjoy rest. Third, a Sabbath-oriented society best gives rest. A generation ago, railroaders in the United States worked seven days a week, ten hours a day, every day of the year. Clearly, such working conditions were anti-biblical and, in terms of biblical law, criminal. Not surprisingly, the railroad tycoons were on the whole a group of thoroughly reprobate men. When the fourth commandment rules it unlawful to deny even the earth and domesticated animals their Sabbath, 
how much more so the denial of rest to man. And yet, clearly, the shorter working hours, the paid vacations, five eight-hour day work weeks have failed to give men true rest. The increase of heart attacks, ulcers and other stress-induced ailments and diseases makes it clear that the change in working conditions has not been any help to man. Because the older order, ungodly as it was, still was closer to a Christian faith and order, man had, in the face of lawless working conditions, a greater ability to rest than does the man of the late 20th century. In a Sabbath-oriented society, the provident man, having lived debt-free, finding rest in Christ and able both to work and to relax, has a peace and joy in life lacking in a frenetic generation. But, fourth, since all law has reference to the future and is in essence a plan for the future, the Sabbath law is a plan for the world's tomorrow. The biblical law works to eliminate evil and to abolish poverty and debt. The Sabbath law has as its work the recreation of man, animals and the earth, the whole of creation. The Sabbath thus reveals the design and direction of the whole law. It is a declaration of the future the law is establishing. Thus, while Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 makes it clear that the formalisms of the Old Testament observances are ended, the essence of the law is in force and is basic to all biblical law. Non-Christian thought, when oriented to the future, faces a double penalty. First, it's past bound. The, quote, civil rights, end quote, revolutions, for example, has only the vaguest sense of the burdens of responsibility which any person thinking in terms of reality and the future needs to have. Instead, the, quote, civil rights, end quote, revolutionists speak endlessly of past evils, not merely real or imagined evils of their own experiencing, but all evils which they believe their ancestors suffered. Similarly, some labour union men and American Indians dwell endlessly on past history rather than present reality. This inability to live in the present means a radical incapacity for coping with the future. Second, the non-Christian, as he faces the future, is at best utopian and unrealistic. As Mumford noted, each utopia was a closed society for the prevention of human growth. Man is reduced to economic man and viewed in terms of an externalism which destroys man. Utopianism not only presents an illusory or dangerous picture of the future, but it also distorts and destroys the present. Utopianism thus affords man no help as he works towards the future. It gives man illusions which beget only needless sacrifice and work and produce nothing but social chaos.